<laughs> when I was uh, 16 years old, my mother, uh, who's a special ed adult school, an adult special ed school teacher, uh, adult education and learning disabilities in the community, uh, she said to me, Hector, she said, uh, you're going to come along and help me set up the lesson and, uh, and work with the adults in the community and uh, you're going to help me run my, my class with the people with disabilities in the community. And I, of course, went, I am not. Uh, you know, there's absolutely no way I'm doing that. What will my friends think? Blah, blah, blah. You know, everything that any teenager back in the 80s, you know, would have said. You know, it, I mean, it's fair to say people with disabilities were segregated. People with disabilities had separate schools, separate classes. Uh, we didn't have the whole kind of honest relationship we have with uh, mental health nowadays. Uh, People with disabilities were even less employed than they are today. Uh, but actually, it was the best thing I ever did. And now, you know, when I, I do work in schools and I talk to, to teenagers and I say, you know, find what you love, because uh, 20 years later, I kind of, you know, I find myself at Microsoft with this uh, incredible job where we actually really are thinking about how we motivate, mobilize, and empower people with disabilities all, uh, all over the world. Uh, so, my job at Microsoft uh, is that I, I, I link into an amazing accessibility team that's been kind of reimagined over the last couple of years, uh, led by a Brit. Uh, we should kind of wave the flag for Great Britain. Uh, led by somebody called Jenny Leigh Flurry, who I would absolutely encourage you to, uh, to follow on, on social media. Uh, Jenny is, uh, is deaf, uh, and she's a senior executive on the board working alongside Satya Nadella and the rest uh, as a deaf individual. Uh, and uh, she almost left Microsoft two years ago because of Skype, uh, because fundamentally the business model changed. People used to meet in meeting rooms, and then everybody said, hey, we don't need to meet in meeting rooms anymore. Uh, we'll just do it all by, you know, by voice over, uh, over Skype meetings. And then she went, well, that's me out, uh, because <laughs> I can't contribute anymore. Uh, and, and she was picked up by HR at the time, and, uh, and actually the senior leadership team, because Satya was kind of on his, on his way up at this point, and they went, well, don't walk away. Let's fix this. This is like, you know, if you're having this issue, Think of all the millions of people across the world who, who are facing similar uh, exclusion as tech advances. Uh, now, we're in a, an amazing time of digital transformation right now. Uh, and people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the reality is, is we're kind of starting to use other people's computers. You know, we're, we're, we're benefiting from the cloud and, and the speed of data uh, moving around the world. Uh, and, and the view of Microsoft right now from the top, and I have to say, any of you working in businesses, you have to get the top people interested in this. It's, you know, it's very difficult to do from the, from the bottom. Uh, but the view from the top is that, that we, have, we have an opportunity to make sure that people with disabilities are not left behind. People with disabilities are the largest niche group in the world because they are one in six. You know, there, there, are, there are billions of people, uh, 1.4 billion people in the world who have a disability. And that disability, as we all move towards technology, and, and depending on technology and getting the news from technology and, and finding our social uh, you know, life on, on technology, we simply cannot afford to leave people with disabilities behind. Uh, not least because when Bill Gates said, you know, I, want, I imagine one day there will be a, a computer on the desk of every office or you know, the desk of every home, and now there's one in everyone's pocket and on your wrist you know, and in your car. You know, we're having Cortana-powered cars now. Uh, so, so, so how on earth can we leave people with disabilities behind? And so, so, so this is a, a big commitment from Microsoft, and it is kind of a, a company-wide engagement. But we, can have the, we have the luxury of doing it because of cloud, because of you know, the cloud revolution that's happening all around us. Now, there's a great book uh, called The Cloud for Go Global Good that I would encourage you to read. I mean, it's actually one of those kind of company tomes that is actually worth reading, because it tells us to kind of reimagine job losses for people around the world through digital transformation and the inclusion of people with their access needs. So, so it's well worth, well, well worth a look. Um, we've got to convince the shareholders, though, that this is important as well. So, so some of the things that you'll start to see is, is Satya is making accessibility core uh, to every design team, talking about us employing more people with disabilities and making sure that they're involved in the whole process of bringing a product to market and the ongoing support. Uh, how many people know that Microsoft has a disability answer desk? I can't see anyone. Good, no one. You know, that's a good start, right? We're at ground zero here. Uh, we also have what's called an enterprise disability answer desk. And the enterprise disability answer desk is kind of where people can go and ask questions free of charge to certify the products they've got for accessibility. The disability answer desk is that so anybody with a disability can get in touch and find out how to use their computer or how to use their assistive technology and even their third party assistive technology. So that is all supported by Microsoft. Uh, we get 24,000 calls a month. 
for that disability onto desk. Uh, and yet no one in the room knew about it, so we won, you know, we won a few more. Um, at the shareholders meeting last year, uh, Anne Taylor, one of my colleagues who's, who's blind, I have to say, used to be one of our fiercest critics uh, online uh, in terms of our accessibility. She's now one of our most beloved colleagues. Uh, she stood up at the, at the shareholders meeting and showed all of those money-hungry you know, <laughs> investors and sort of like, this is how I use a computer and this is what Microsoft are investing in, as she showed everyone what a screen reader looked like and, and, and the investment that we were putting into uh, Office and, and Windows uh, with, through Narrator. Um, one of the things that really empowers us to, 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 to help people imagine disability is this new definition from the World Health Organization about uh, what disability actually is. Disability used to be such a medical model. You know, it's like, you have this, yeah? You have motor neuron disease, you have ALS, you have Parkinson's. Does it matter? You know, does the diagnosis help, does it? Or actually, why don't we just recognize the mismatch between you and the thing you're trying to achieve? So, so, so the World Health Organization defines disability as a mismatched human interaction, uh, you know, a mismatch between you and what you're actually trying to do. All of us are disabled in some ways. Who has uh, an Xbox? More than heard about the disability answer, so that says the crowd. Uh, um, who has heard of Copilot? No one. Good. Uh, so, so I am gaming disabled. Let's put it like that. I used to not be gaming disabled in the 80s and the 90s. I was playing Goldeneye on a NES. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for nodding at me. That's so kind of you. Uh, yeah. uh, OK. And now uh, my kids are kind of into Pokemon Sun and Moon. I, I, just don't, I mean, I didn't understand Pokemon first time around. The second time around, I'm really struggling. Uh, but, uh, but I am totally gaming disabled. My kids are playing games now. I'm just like, I remember how to play. I used to be able to play FIFA, but I, I can't anymore. And now what my kids can go is, all right, Dad, you just do the kicking and the, uh, you know, the kicking and the tackling, and I'll do the steering. And I'm like, what? Yeah, there's this thing called Copilot where we have two controllers, one person. Okay, you help me with my disability. Now that also think about people with disabilities who who have physical disabilities, who are just cut out of gaming altogether, who cannot manage all the different buttons, but suddenly can play with their dad, uh, play a computer game. So so this is the the concept that designing for the mainstream. It can then be reimagined for people with disabilities, yeah? and everyone benefits. So uh, we know that 70% of disabilities are uh, completely invisible. Uh, it's even worse in the workplace. I mean, within families, people are willing to talk about problems and, uh, and disability. But in the workplace, who feels truly confident to talk about that? If somebody's losing hearing, do they tell you? Do they declare that disability? Or do they just routinely get edged out of the workforce because they're not, they don't feel confident to tell you what adjustment needs to happen for them? We used to have computer personalization, but it, we all then kind of homogenized. Uh, we've got to kind of start bringing some of that back. But also what we truly believe at Microsoft is that the Microsoft tools must be so much better and so, so normal that people just absorb accessibility needs over time. They don't go to JAWS. I love JAWS, Adil, he's going to smile at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're narrator fans tonight, all right? <laughs> uh, but, but what we want to do is, is allow people to kind of gradually require these features, uh, find out what kind of a baseline looks like in terms of accessibility, and then signpost to the specialist tools as the need becomes more, uh, more specific. Um, and so with, this is how we're thinking about disability right now. OK, uh, 26,000 people in the US have an upper arm, uh, you know, a limb extremity, you know, uh, a limb missing. OK, uh, 8 million people in the US temporarily have a limb uh, disorder, break their arm, sprain their wrist. OK, uh, and I, th I think it was 13 million. It was 13 million for, for, the, temp for the arm breaking. Uh, and then 8 million people would be kind of trying to use a computer while holding their baby. And they're all the same thing. They're all, frankly, the same thing. They're all the same problem. They're all one-armed computing. But why should we have to go to the wheelchair setting to kind of make that work? Yeah? Why don't we just use to a different form factor and be able to access our files on a tablet for a while rather than a full desktop? Yeah? Why, why, why are we thinking about the specific disability solution rather than thinking about the situational disability or the personalization that I just require in that setting? Uh, Voice is the perfect one, isn't it? I think uh, I love the question about um, the Alexa. I do three things with my Alexa. I'm the Microsoft guy talking about how much I love my Alexa. Uh, I, I can do this here. I can't redo it in Redmond. I get kind of a frowned at. Uh, but I do three things to my uh, Alexa every, every morning, every single morning. Who's got an Alexa? Yeah? OK, first thing, you do, uh, first thing you do with your Alexa when you get up next tomorrow morning is you go into your thing and you say, hey, Alexa, uh, good morning. 
And what happens when, she, when you say good morning? Good morning, on this day. Thank you, I did. See, now, it took the blind dude, right, to kind of, you know, to know that it does this, because you would ask it, right? Uh, you're me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, on this day, what did happen today? I wasn't home this morning. Thank you. Right, he is so much more intelligent than you today. Yeah, he's going to the water cooler, and he's going to go, hey, I know what happened on this day of history. What are you doing? Uh, so, 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 so that's the first thing I do because I want to be that annoying git, you know, that goes to work and go, hey, this day in history, you know that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Because because I need that social relevance. Yeah, you know, and you all need that social re relevance. You know, you know, we have the water cooler movement. What did you wa watch on TV? As we all move to Netflix and stuff, it's like nobody watched the same program last night. So, so we've got to learn to talk about something, right? Uh, the next thing I do is say, hey, Alexa, I play Radio 4, and I kind of reinforce just how old I am uh, every morning uh, in the kitchen. And my kids go, no, nah, play Nirvana. And I'm like, no, just put the news back on. Uh, and my kids kind of voice argue over what radio gets played. And then I say, what's my commute to work? Yeah, and it tells me how long it is. And then I say, hey, Alexa, send this to Office 365. Send a reminder to Office 365 uh, for my diary at 10 o'clock. Yeah because I'm learning over time what that voice control device can do for me. Uh, of course, reframe that now for somebody with a severe physical disability. Reframe that now for somebody who's blind uh, and think, actually, just that inclusive design made a massive difference. Um, only one boring slide, I promise, uh, and that's this one. Uh, policies and regulation are critically important in all of this. And to a company like Microsoft, we really don't get support unless we talk about policies and regulation. Uh, there's a really important European standard called EN301549. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it would. It's like one slide for Brexit, isn't it? This is like, well, yeah, of course it would be. Yeah. All right. Uh, EN301549 basically puts a focus on public sector bodies procuring accessible and making sure that accessibility is considered in their procurement of technology. Now, that has to happen. We have to make them beg that question and ask that question. Yeah? Because once they ask that question, then they start asking why. Okay? And then they can start revisiting their kind of employment statistics around disability and then thinking about the tools that make uh, accessibility a thing. This is a kind of where we are right now within Microsoft. And I, I wouldn't even put us at five. I promise you I wouldn't. I would put maybe Redmond at five. Taking accessibility global is a real challenge, and it's not just technology, it's culture as much as, as, as anything. Uh, but the way we view it is that it starts with inclusive hiring. Okay, and, you know, if you have a disability and you know anything about technology, apply for a job at Microsoft, I and mean, please do. Yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, it's not a, we can't say it's a kind of a, a, you know, it won't jump you ahead of the queue, but we tag our jobs based on disability now and inclusive, you know, saying that we're actively looking for people with, uh, you know, with, with access needs and with disability. Uh, so, so once we get those people in our teams, inclusive design follows through because when you're working with somebody is in your team yeah, and they have a disability and they've, they've got, say, we, we had a great successful autism hiring program uh, last year in the States and they're bringing different perspectives and your team is having to work around accessibility needs on a daily basis. It's just a much more vibrant, you know, feeling. Everybody's just much more organized. Uh, you know, everybody's kind of much more kind of uh, empathetic and actually the ideas and, the, you know, the conversations that, that start riffing off disability when you say, yes, it's there and it's in the room and we're all kind of designing with it in mind, we get inclusive design. We've got this thing called the Inclusive Design Toolkit that I would encourage you all to, to download. It gives you um, fact cards on inclusive design and, and, and exercises. Uh, so it's this kind of school of thought that we're living. Because we've got inclusive, then when we've got inclusive design, we then have new tools that we can use. You know, I look at kind of the assistive technology industry, and I was in it, I've been in it for 20 years. Um, I could tell you some of the horror products I have seen in my life. I could genuinely tell you. Uh, but, the, but the one thing that is happening in assistive technology is it's always following. It's always kind of, yeah, Microsoft did this, now let's fix it. Yeah, you know, let, now let's kind of, you know, let's sell a product that kind of solves that problem that they didn't think of. That doesn't just happen in assistive technology, that happens in, you know, office, you know, tools for office and plugins for office. Um, but when I speak to people in the assistive technology world, I really want you to start reimagining what you could do with machine learning, or artificial intelligence, or bots. Yeah? Uh, I'd like you to start thinking about uh, uh, the, the tools like HoloLens and how you might start creating tools for assistive technology based on augmented reality. These are the things that, that, that the next generation of people with disabilities will jump all over. I loved Zaid's video earlier where he said, uh, you know, my Motorola Razr. <coughs> he didn't wait for the specialist thing. The thing he got most excited about was his Motorola Razr and, and, and Siri. Um, 
once we've got these new toolkit uh, envisaged around disability, then we start to see accessible mainstream ideas that have got some uh, semblance of accessibility in them in terms of thinking about disability, but just, they're just better for everybody. And I'm going to give you some examples of these in a moment. Once we've got accessible product out into the market, we've got uh, accessible procurement to talk about, which means that the barrier to work for people with disabilities has been lowered. The third most required skill of any human being applying for a job today is what? This is a Microsoft talk, so you might, uh, you might be able to preempt this. Is office. Globally, the third most required attribute is office. Now, if you're disabled and you can't use office, you, have got, you are missing the third most common attribute that, that will get somebody into a job. As soon as we let people know that the tech is accessibility and disabled people are turning up at interview going, yeah, I use Outlook, yeah, I use OneNote, yeah, I use all these things, then, then, then it just changes the view of that person and makes them more employable. And then we get more people into businesses and this whole thing just reiterates. Um, this, this new toolkit is there. Think about geolocation. Think about face recognition and Windows Hello. Is anybody using Windows Hello? You're not. Windows Hello is just amazing because I don't ever need to remember a password again. You know, I can just put my computer on in the morning, I look at it, and it goes, hi, Hector, and I just log in. Now imagine I had a severe physical disability. That thing about privacy earlier, about um, you know, if you had a carer in your house with a banking, imagine like, being, having a severe physical disability with ALS or a spinal cord injury, a new carer every six weeks and having to give them your login details yeah, and not knowing what they're doing with your banking. But Windows Hello solves that yeah, because you can just log in with your face. Yep. OK, so start thinking. Now, OK, challenges for you. Uh, this is Office 365. Uh, and this is on your review tab now, OK? Third button in, check accessibility. How many of you have ever checked the accessibility of a document before you sent it, as opposed to a website before you sent it? Thank you, one. And great honesty, maybe two or three. OK, why not? You checked your spelling, because you kind of thought, if I send this out with a load of spelling mistakes, either the person I send it to will think I'm, you know, I can't spell, or the person I'm sending it to won't be able to read it or understand it. Exactly the same for accessibility. There's a built-in accessibility checker in Office that will go through your document and say, these images are missing uh, tags, this scan order in this PowerPoint presentation is all wrong, and then you, you, get this, you don't get a clean bill of health. You can then, it gives you all the recommendations of what to change, and then your document <coughs> is accessible, and then you can send it out. My challenge to you today is to go back and look back at some of your PowerPoints and to the presenters who turned up tonight. Uh, and, and mine's not fully accessible. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving this to anyone yet. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but when I get like a document that says, no accessibility issues were found in this document, and then I send it off to my team that includes 12 people who are blind, four people who are deaf, various people with autism in our, in our accessibility team, I know that everyone can read it because I've got the colleagues who require that for me to think that way. If you don't have the colleagues that think that way, how would you know? Or why would you care? But actually, in this connected world, your document could end up anywhere. You know, it could end up. And you don't know that your customer is not using a screen reader. So checking the accessibility of a document is really great. But it's pretty difficult for us to imagine that every human being will go and do that. Uh, so this is where the cloud comes in. Uh, now, when you insert an image in PowerPoint, the cloud names it and puts the alt text in for you, puts the tags, the description in for you. This is exactly what it did with that image. OK, I dropped my photo in PowerPoint, and it went, hey, that's a turd of giraffe walking across a dry, uh, across a dry, dry grass field. Perfect. The internet did it. Yeah? The internet, the cloud, will make your documents accessible. That's the beauty of it. That's the challenge for us. That's what's going to be amazing for us in the future. Websites won't have to be made accessible. The cloud will make websites accessible. That's, the, that's what we will do. Um, so there are various rules about what an accessible document is, and you can all take this slide. We actually have these as posters that you can put up in your office. Yeah, you can literally just hang these up and go, don't be a douche. You know, make, your, make your stuff accessible, right? Uh, and these are things that I didn't routinely do before I joined Microsoft. This is one of the most amazing uh, things, is links. You know, every time I get an email from somebody and it's got like, this long URL, you know, why do I want to look at that? Why don't you rename the hyperlink? What's wrong with you? Because it's, you know, that's, that's an extra job that I don't want to do. We now do that for you. you know, Office 365 now does that for you, uh, which makes it much nicer for somebody using a screen reader. OK, uh, let's get more accessibility into your lives. Who uses any kind of photo translation app? Yeah, great. OK, download this today. OK, download Microsoft Translator. It is probably the best app we do. It is like I use it all the time. This is me 
playing uh, Monopoly with my kids. My kids' French teachers are dreadful. I mean, they re I thought mine were bad. They were really bad. Right? Uh, the reason we don't learn languages is because it just doesn't really excite us. You know, we're not really excited by it. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to learn, learn about Jean-Marc and La Rochelle. I don't really care. Yeah. But when I'm playing Monopoly and I can just get the app out and go, come on then, here's the French. Let's go through this together and I'll explain the verbs and the words. And they love it. The kids love it. I, I, I translate Harry Potter pages with the app. This works with Hindi, Catalan, uh, Bengal, uh, Bangla. Uh, it works with Polish, Swedish, it works you know, with uh, languages that you'd be quite surprised. It works with Klingon because Microsoft can never remove the full geek. Uh, uh, you know, it's always going to have a little bit left in there. Uh, but that's great for translation because your, your societal you know, disability is you can't talk Chinese. Yeah? But now let's think about somebody who's deaf. Somebody who's deaf, I, c I now go, if I see somebody using a sign language or using a sign, uh, who's, who's, who's a signer, uh, I go up to them and talk to them with this app, and I speak into it, and it, it, it gives me my text, and I show it to them, and they read it, and I talk to them. Yeah? Because it can just give me English subtitles the same way it can give me Bangla subtitles. So, so the fact that we designed this, but reframed it and thought about disability while we did it, made sure we did English to English. Yeah? Because English to English is really important. Uh, the next time you grab an Uber, we're in London, so this is, this is relevant. Uh, Think about the language disabilities we all have. The gig economy means that people who don't speak English are jumping in cars and ferrying you around London. Great, it's amazing, but we're not talking to them because, because there's a language mis you know, there's a language gap. So now every time I grab an Uber, I'm genuinely, I, I bore them to death. I kind of, hey, look at this. Yeah? And they start thinking, God, I can use this when all these tourists come around and I can start talking to them. You know, it, it is that good. Um, it's not just available as an app, though. It's available as a standalone uh, website, translator.microsoft.com. And just this week, we're really excited to tell you, uh, we have put it into PowerPoint. Now, why would we put subtitles into PowerPoint? Well, we do it for disability, right? Yeah? That's one reason. That's a great reason. It's a really important reason. The quality of this is really very good now. You know, we're getting it to about 88% accurate, is what we say. Uh, all and I are gonna. Don't you dare start writing it differently on here, all right? I, I, I want you. No, no, no. Uh, all, all and I were having this discussion earlier. Um, generally, we accept in America. <laughs> in order. <we? laughs> uh, generally, we accept in America that, that it's 94% accurate. Now, all it is like 99.99999. Yeah, we know, we know this, right? But uh, you know, generally, we know that there's a certain level of inaccuracy that we're willing to accept. And if you have no subtitles in a meeting because of you know, the cost of a, of a service, or actually people just don't do it, why don't we just bring subtitles into every meeting if we've got somebody who's, uh, who, who's hard of hearing? Okay. Um, at the end of your PowerPoint presentation, though, a few more things can happen. We can take a transcript of your meeting, which then means that it just gets taken into your minutes, and you can go back to your, the recording of your voice and see what came up in the meeting. So it's useful for all of us. Yeah? If you've got somebody who doesn't have strong English, they can have a QR code that's presented at the start of the presentation, take it to their app on their phone, and they can be watching it coming up in Swedish. Yeah? So, so this is the power and the mainstream use of disability features. OK, this one, Office Lens. This is Office Lens. I use this for my expenses all the time, and I throw my receipts straight away. Yeah? But somebody who was blind or had dyslexia would be able to look at that text Set up the immersive reader on their iPhone, and then it will read out what's on that document for them. So you could go and use it in a for a menu, you know, in a, in a restaurant. Yeah. So it's got disability, but it's great for my expenses, and it puts the document to my OneDrive, or so it gives me a PDF which retains its accessibility features. So it's this idea that 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 we all find it useful, but we reframe it and imagine it for somebody who has the disability. Okay. Uh, a few things I can, I'm going to finish. Uh, reading any more than six words in a line is inefficient. Uh, I don't know if anyone knew that, but people with dyslexia really struggle to keep all the way along a line of text. So the new read mode uh, in, uh, in, in Word forces you to, or gives you kind of different colors, but can give you this narrow view, which is much easier to consume text. We all consume text better when it's presented at six words a line, all of us. And the newspaper people used to know this like <laughs> years ago. Uh, since computers, we kind of forgot. Uh, learning tools in OneNote, if anybody have, any here has kids or ha you know, people have dyslexia or people in the workplace have dyslexia, you can take the text from your phones, dump it into OneNote. OneNote will read it out. OneNote will translate it. 
OneNote will also highlight the verbs, the adjectives, the nouns using the cloud. It will also change the word spacing. It will also split the syllables to make it easier to read, and it will let you change the text width. These are all standard features in Word. Okay. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm really happy to take any questions. Uh, there are no, uh, there's no question I will not answer. So please, if there's any kind of grumbling Microsoft questions you'd love to ask me, I will, I will do my best. Yeah, hi. Um, so I've got two. I'll try and make it quick. The first one: What future technologies are you excited about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the second one: uh, All of the speakers talked about, you know, how much control technology can give to people with disabilities. Um, do you think? I'm sure you are, but how much do you think about the security? So we give so much control yeah. to technology. We're, it, it's actually quite scary because we can give them yeah. stuff like passwords and stuff like yeah. that. How do we? How do you tackle? That? Yeah. So so. Um it's not my expertise, the security thing, but, but what I will tell you is that, that uh, Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, is pushing this uh, digital Geneva convention right now, because it's this idea that at some point we have to put the trust in place. You know, like our politicians, we have to have trust. Yeah, with the tech firms, we have to have trust. You know, we have to find a way to trust, and we have to find regulation and policies and laws that, that, that allow us to do all of this. Um, what's interesting is I have a lot of people who say we can't put accessibility features in because of security issues, or we can't put Office 365 in because it's on the cloud and we worry about in our workplace about that security. Yeah, okay. Uh, but they still have then the hotels putting Alexas in the bedrooms, and then that's listening to everything you say. I could tell you a great Alexa joke about my... my, my I could tell you a great joke about my. I'll tell you afterwards. I've got a great. Uh, I've got a great Alexa joke to tell you. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Um, so, so security. As we all move to cloud, and as information is pushed up there, we've got to find a way to get this trust, security, everything in place. Um, what's interesting is people are willing to revisit this security argument that they've absolutely kind of null and voided. They kind of said no, no security, cloud. When we start framing around accessibility, that whole thing in the NHS that happened at the weekend. I just wanted to just stick a hand up and go, hang on a minute. If your security is 15 years old because you're using XP, what the hell are your accessibility features like? Yeah? But no one asks that question. We've got to raise that bar. We've got to put accessibility higher up. And things like Cloud for Global Good allow us to do it. You know, that is, that's the thing that goes to Davos, that document. That's the one where they take it and go, hey, think about accessibility. That's one of the wins here. And then let's, let's, let's think about that while we're doing some of the security things. Uh, what am I excited about? I mean, I'm massively excited about HoloLens and, and you know, augmented reality. I, I'm not a huge fan of virtual reality. I'm, I just don't feel comfortable in virtual reality. I feel lost. I don't like feeling lost and not knowing where I am. Uh, but what HoloLens and augmented reality does means we put headsets on and we, uh, you know, we're still in our safe space. Yeah, uh, and so I'm doing tests in schools at the moment where we're doing wheelchair driving tests for kids, where they are driving round tables and learning how to do it with their head switches without any risk of breaking their knees by ramming into the tr into the things because we're doing augmented reality. It's not actually there. Uh, at Halloween this year, I locked zombies in all of my drawers and uh, you know my uh, cupboards in the house, and my kids went round and we're unlocking doors to like get real life zombies in the cupboards. Uh, but think about that from an education perspective, you know, and, and kind of simulating uh, role playing for kids with autism and communities and things like that. I think there's, there's, there's huge things coming on AR. Yep. Okay, we are going to end the formality okay. there. I know people have trains to go to and um, you know families to see. Can we thank all of our speakers? It's been a great event.